Grass is soft, like the angel hair pasta. Kind of grass, kind of resembles that. I guess. Just I don't know. <laughs> I've been blind since birth. I have a disease called Leber's congenital amaurosis. People often ask me. You know, is it hard being blind? Is it scary? It, it's not. It's just a normal way of life for me. when I was angry about being blind. I was very into makeup and trying to look my best. I really wanted to look in the mirror and see what I look like, but I couldn't. The Lord spoke to me and he told me that I am beautiful on the inside and that I don't have to worry about what I look like on the outside and that he is the only one who can tell me what I look like. The mirror can't. Sometimes I feel like I'm a little bit of a burden to people. See you back in front of you, girl. Sometimes I wish I didn't really need that much help. I wish that I didn't have to rely on them. Okay, got everything else? Yep. Alright, we're on the front of the side. I'll break too. <laughs> Oh, 
If I could see, I don't think my faith would be as strong. Because for a blind person, you have to rely on the Lord. It's like your faith becomes more real because you're used to not seeing things. You're used to believing in someone that you can't see. Like for example, my mom, I can't see her. I may be able to hear her, but even if I couldn't, I can't see her, but I know she's there. So for me, I think it's easier to know and to understand that though I can't see God, he's really there. I think it has a lot to do with walking by faith and not by sight. I have this desire to help people, but I feel like being blind sort of limits me as to what I can do. But the reality is God has given me a gift of singing for him and leading worship. And I feel like that's my way of helping people. And I'm grateful for that. I have so much joy and so much anticipation because I know that the first face I'm ever going to see is Jesus. And that means the world to me. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. We want to go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Dear Lord, we're thankful, God. We're thankful for your blessings on us, Lord. We know, God, that you are a good, good Father and that you're in control of all that's going on right now. Lord, we uh, look forward to the time when we can meet together again as a church family in this building, Lord. But for now... We're, uh, we're thankful to be able to uh, be able to worship online. We pray, God, for this, uh, that this music, that this worship, Lord, would be, uh, would be a blessing to those who are listening, Lord. We pray, God, that it, this would just be a introduction, Lord, and a lead up to uh, Brother Ben's message for today. God, we just thank you again for your many blessings and your protection, Lord. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. 
I keep thinking if one person's life is changed by what I go through, it will all be worth it. Wow, what a movie. I hope that you were able to, to rent the movie I Still Believe and watch it. My family and I watched it a couple weeks ago and it is a really good movie and so I encourage you to watch it if you have not uh, yet. Today we're going to continue our study, uh, this series I Still Believe. Today will be our final message. If you missed the first message we preached last Sunday, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch that. Uh, normally uh, on this particular Sunday of the year we preach on Palm Sunday. And we're not going to do that this year because we're in, the, we're in this series. And so next week is Easter Sunday, April 12th. We'll be saying more about that at the end of our, our message today. So be listening for those announcements. But I love this funny story about Palm Sunday. It was Palm Sunday, but because of a sore throat, five-year-old Sammy stayed home from church with a babysitter. When the family returned home, they were carrying several palm branches. And so Sammy asked what they were for. And his dad said, well, people held them over Jesus' head as he walked by. And Sammy complained. He said, wouldn't you know it? The one Sunday I don't go and Jesus shows up. So uh, I hope that Jesus shows up today in our study. And I believe that he's going to. Our text is going to be out of Hebrews chapter 11. If you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to grab it and put it in front of you. Hebrews chapter 11 will be our text, verse 6. And also, we're going to go to Mark 5 and Luke 18 a little bit later. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Last Sunday, we talked about divine dilemma and unanswered prayers. And we discussed three practical ways that we can respond when we're confused, we're frustrated, or we're angry about the way God's responding or not responding to us. When we find ourselves in those situations, we can choose to wait, we can continue walking with God, and or we can worship God. Well, today we're going to take it a step further and talk about the imperative ingredient needed in these and any of the other ways that we choose to. To respond to God. So today I want to talk to us for the next few moments about the imperative ingredient. Would you pray with me? Father, I ask you right now to speak to our hearts. We need this message today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. The imperative ingredient is our faith. Everybody say faith on the count of three. One, two, three, faith. faith. Wherever you are. One, two, three, faith. faith. It takes faith to wait, faith to keep walking with God, faith to worship. The author of Hebrews reminds us that without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Martin Luther King Jr. said, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. Jesus says in John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you're going to have trouble, but take heart. In other words, Jesus is saying, have faith, I have overcome the world. I want to share with you again the chorus from Jeremy Camp's song, Walk by Faith. You ought to write these words down. In this song he sings, well I will walk by faith. Even when I cannot see. It's because this broken road prepares your will for me. 
Well, today we're going to look at three powerful examples of faith. And these are, I believe there, there are some of you here today that are listening to this message. And you're going to hear these stories. And I pray that you'll be encouraged by them. The broken road that you're currently traveling is difficult. But God has a plan and a purpose for it. Even if you cannot see or understand what is happening, I want you to know that God is faithful. Our God is faithful. There are others today that are listening to this message, and you're going to hear these stories, and you're going to be reminded of difficult seasons that God has faithfully delivered you from. Some of you are nodding your head, and you're saying amen right now. And finally, there are those of you here today who will sooner or later enter into a season that tests your faith. So my hope today is that these stories that we share will come back to your mind right when you need them. And during that time, you will choose to walk by faith. I encourage you to take notes today. If you choose to walk by faith, you're going to have, first of all, a bold faith. The first story I want to share with you today involves a miracle. Look with me at Mark chapter 5. You may remember last week we looked at the story of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and his interaction with Jesus. And we learned Jairus was in a unique situation where he had to keep walking with Christ for 18 verses before receiving an answer to his request. Well, today we're going to look at the woman who interrupted Jesus as he walked with Jairus. And the faith that she had to exercise just to get to Jesus. And so from the passage in Mark 5, we know there was a woman in Mark 5, 25 and 26. There was a woman there, there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. This is in and of itself an incredibly difficult position to be in. She's sick, she's seeing doctors, and she's getting nowhere. To add insult to injury, she spent all her money in the process, and after 12 long years, she truly has no options left. So what we don't learn from the passage in Mark 5 is that her issue of bleeding would have made her ceremonial unclean according to the Levitical law, which you can read about in Leviticus chapter 15, verses 25 through 27. What does that mean? Well, being unclean would have excluded her from all forms of Jewish worship, both in the synagogue and at the temple. Every chair and bed that she sat on or slept in would have also, be, would also been unclean. And anyone who touched them would have been, become unclean. Now, this may sound uh, confusing, but it's all important information as we try to comprehend the pain and the loneliness that this woman was living in. For 12 years she was unable to worship with her community. She was unable to share her home with others. She was unable to find relief from her pain. You know, we've had a month of staying at home because of coronavirus, and, and we can't go out at least, unless it's essential, we can't go out at least until April the 30th. Think about this. This lady had been quarantined, literally, for 12 years. It is from this desperate place that an unbelievable act of faith happened. And correspondingly, tremendous miracle occurred. When she heard about Jesus, the Bible says she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. This woman experienced an immediate miracle as the healing power of Jesus flowed into her body. She was instantaneously restored to fellowship, to the community, and to physical health because of her bold act of faith. And bold faith is exactly how I would describe the subject of our next story as well. Story number two involves a missionary. Andrew Van Deer Bill was his name. We're going to call him Brother Andrew. He's a Christian missionary and and a founder of the organization Open Doors, and he's known for smuggling Bibles into communist countries during the height of the Cold War. Well, Brother Andrew recounts a risky incident from early in his ministry. And on this particular occasion, Brother Andrew approached the Romanian border in his car, which was packed 
with illegal Bibles. He could only hope the border guards were moving swiftly and not paying much attention, which might allow him to pass through undetected. But just as he was hoping this, Brother Andrew saw the guard stop the car at the front of the line. He watched in anticipation as the vehicle's owners were forced to take out all the car's contents and spread them on the ground for inspection. Each car that followed received the same treatment, with the fourth car inspection lasting the longest. The guard took a full hour to sift through it, including removing hubcaps, taking the engine apart, and even removing the seats. Brother Andrew remembers praying in his car, Dear Lord, what am I going to do? And as he prayed, a bold idea came to Brother Andrew. This was the idea. He said, I, I know that no amount of cleverness on my part can get me through this border search. Dare I ask for a miracle? Let me take some of the Bibles out and leave them in the open where they will be seen. So putting the Bibles out in the open would, would truly be depending on God. Rather than his own intelligence, he thought. So when the guards ushered Andrew forward, he did just this. He said, I handed him my papers and started to get out, but his knee was against the door, holding it closed. And then the almost unbelievable happened. The guard looked at Brother Andrew's passport and abruptly waved him on. He remembers surely 30 seconds had not passed. Brother Andrew started the engine and began pulling away, all the while wondering if he was supposed to pull over so the car could be taken apart and examined. He said, I coasted forward, my foot poised above the brake. He said, nothing happened. I looked out the rear mirror. The guard was waving the next car to a stop, indicating to the driver that he had to get out. Let me tell you something. God had cleared the way for Brother Andrew to smuggle the Word of God to Christians who had no access to the Bible. Look at, listen, look at this quote on the screen. This missionary said, The Bible is full of ordinary people who went to impossible places and did wondrous things simply because they decided to obey God. By all measures, this, was a, this is a gigantic act of faith in the face of a near certain disaster. Ladies and gentlemen, young people, it, it is the striking boldness of these first two stories that should remind all of us that faith often precipitates a step into the unknown. If you choose to walk by faith, you're going to have a bold faith. But secondly, you're going to have a believing faith. The pastor describes a time when his daughter, Melody Jan, she was five years old. She came to him and she asked him for a dollhouse. And so her dad, John, nodded and promised to build her one. Then he went back to reading his book. Soon he glanced out the study window and saw her arms filled with dishes, toys, and dolls, making trip after trip until she had a great pile of playthings in the yard. He asked his wife what their five-year-old daughter was doing, and his wife said, you promised to build her a dollhouse, and she believes you. She's just getting ready for it. John said, you'd thought I'd been hit by an atom bomb. He said, I threw aside that book. I raced to the lumber yard for supplies and quickly built that little girl a dollhouse. He said, now why did I respond? Because I wanted to? No. Because she deserved it? No. Her daddy had given his word and she believed it and acted upon it. He said, when I saw her faith, he said nothing could keep me from carrying out my word. That's believing faith, ladies and gentlemen. And I want you to write down these three things about believing faith. Letter A, believing faith is persistent. Our last story highlights the persistence of one who has nothing to lose and everything to gain. Now I want you to look with me at Luke 18 for story number three. In Luke 18, we find the parable of the persistent widow. And the Bible says in the first eight verses, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. He said in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. There was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, she was persistent. 
He said, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, here's the message. The Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And that's the question we still have to wrestle with today. When he comes again, is he going to find faith on the earth? Is he going to find it in our city? Is he going to find it in our church? Is he going to find it in you? Believing faith is persistent, but it's also predominant. That word predominant means present as the strongest or main element. Let me ask you during this coronavirus time, is your faith predominant? Is your faith persistent? Predominant literally means present as the strongest or main element. Your faith ought to be the strongest thing about you right now. The way we talk and walk during these days will show a lost and dying world whether or not we truly believe God. Whether we truly are who we say we are. If our God really is as amazing as he says that he is. And you and I both know that he is. Our faith should be persistent. It should be predominant. But you know what? Believing faith is also powerful. I love what J.O. Fraser, missionary to China, said. Look at this. Faith is like muscle which grows stronger and stronger with use. Rather than rubber which weakens when it is stretched. In her book, It's My Turn, Ruth Bell Graham tells a story about her growing up days in China where her father was a missionary physician. There was a, a man that went to their church named Mr. K.O. Er. And one day as he attended a prayer meeting, bandits broke into his house and kidnapped his two children, an eight-year-old son and a baby daughter. Well, as the word spread, the local Christian and missionaries got together and, man, they just began to storm the gates of heaven and pray that these children would be safe and they would be brought back to their family. Mr. K.O. Er, never missing an opportunity to witness for Jesus, posted a large sign that said this, listen, the bandits have kidnapped our children and have demanded $1,000 ransom. He said, I'm not a wealthy man. I cannot pay $1,000. I cannot pay $500. I cannot even pay $50. He said, but I believe God. If it is his will, he is able to bring my children back without any ransom. Now that's believing faith. Passersby were amazed by his message. And it was widely expected that the children will be quickly killed. Well, weeks passed and in the course of time, a band of soldiers broke in upon the bandits. As they pursued them, they heard a sound from the ditch beside the road. The one soldier stopped to look, and there he found a skeleton-like child lying in the ditch where the bandits had thrown him. It was Mr. K.O. Er's son. He had been in prison under a large overturned vessel, and he was on the brink of starvation. But he was alive, and he recovered. But what about the baby girl? Well, later there was another battle between the bandits and the soldiers, this time, the wife of the bandit chief was captured. She, found, uh, she was found nursing two babies. They weren't twins. They, they were too near in age to be both her own. Well, guess what? The daughter, too, was returned to her parents. And Ruth Bell Graham recalls, this is her testimony. She said, sitting one Sunday in the little gray brick Chinese church, I watched as Mr. K.O. Er, carrying his still too weak to walk son, and his wife, carrying the now healthy, chubby baby girl, walked forward to publicly give thanks to God and dedicate both children to him. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, young people, if you choose to walk by faith, you're going to have a bold faith. You're going to have a believing faith. But you're going to have thirdly and finally, you're going to have a big faith. Everybody say big faith. Big faith. I was at a house recently of a family in our church. I went into their bathroom, and on their mirror was written in huge letters, we still serve a God that can do the impossible. Do you believe that today? 
really, our faith doesn't have to be big. It just has to be properly placed. This is a good statement to write down. Jay Hudson Taylor said, not a great faith we need, but faith in a great God. We serve a great God today. We serve a great God today. Post that on Facebook right now. We serve a great God today. Author Marshall Shelley suffered through the deaths of two of his children. I can't imagine having several children myself. I can't imagine even one, but two of his children died. And here's what he said. He said, even as a child, I loved to read. And I quickly learned that I would most likely be confused during the opening chapters of a novel. He said new characters were introduced, random events took place, subplots were complicated and didn't seem to make any sense in relation to the main plot. But he said, I learned to keep reading. Why? Because you know that the author, if he or she is good, are going to weave them all together by the end of the book. Eventually, every element, every element is going to be meaningful. At times, he said, such faith has to be a conscience choice. And then he talks about his kids, and he says, even though, even then I can't explain why chromosomal abnormality develops in my son, which prevents him from living on earth more than two minutes. Then he says, even when I can't fathom why our daughter has to endure two years of severe and profound retardation and continual seizures. Seizures, He said, I choose to trust that before the book closes, the author is going to make things clear. That faith is bold. That's the kind of faith that is believing. And that is the kind of faith that is big. In conclusion... Life is quite a journey, isn't it? Do you need this imperative ingredient called faith? I hope you've seen the movie I Still Believe. If you haven't, you need to watch it. Jeremy Camp wrote a song on his honeymoon called I Still Believe. And in the midst of his own frustration and confusion and sadness, Camp wrote this as the last line of his chorus. He said, even when I don't see, I still believe. And that's what I want to leave you with today. In the midst of life storms, when things aren't making sense, and boy, I'm telling you, isn't that timely right now? Come on now. In the midst of life storms, when things aren't making sense, and you and I don't know how to respond to the ways God is responding to us, will you wait on him? Will you keep walking with him? Isn't he worthy of our worship today? Will you worship him? And would you step out in faith today and say, Yes, Lord, even when I don't see, I still believe. I still believe in your faithfulness. Let's pray together. Father, I pray this has been an encouraging word today. I pray it's been a timely word. And I pray we would apply this to our lives. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to encourage you to join us Wednesday for a, a corporate time of prayer. It will start at 630. Uh, we'll send the link out. We'll have a corporate prayer and then we'll have a Bible study. And I hope that you'll join us for that. And next Sunday is Easter Sunday. The best holiday of the year. We're going to celebrate our, our risen Savior. And so we've got some uh, special things planned. And uh, I hope that you'll join us for our online service next Sunday, Easter Sunday. And let me encourage you to invite somebody to watch that service with us. They may watch an Easter service, whereas they won't watch a regular service. So invite somebody to watch our Easter service next Sunday. And most importantly... If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, stay tuned. I'm going to share with you how you can know that Jesus is your Lord. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to share with you what the Bible says, how you can know 
Jesus. The first thing is you must realize that God loves you. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The second thing is, is to realize that everybody is a sinner. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's you, that's me, that's everybody. And then the third thing is, is to realize sin has a price that must be paid for. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. And so because of our sin, we must die. The fourth thing we must realize is that Jesus Christ died to pay for the price for our sins. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God commended, that's just a big word for demonstrated, but God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the fifth thing is, is to finally pray and ask Jesus Christ to be our Savior and claim his promise of eternal life. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is a promise directly from God, that if you will pray to him, confess that you're a sinner, ask him to forgive you of your sins, and accept him to be your savior. He promises to save you and give you his free gift of eternal life. If you want to receive Jesus as your personal Savior, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes right where you are, and I want you to pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died for me in my place for my sins, and that you rose again on the third day. And according to your word, I believe and I confess you as the Lord of my life, and I ask you to be my Savior right now. Jesus name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, I rejoice with you. The Bible says that the angels in heaven are rejoicing and I want to send you a book. This book is called Growing in Christ. It is a 13 lesson book for new and growing Christians. On your screen right now, there is information of how you can contact us and give us your information and we will send that to you this same week. And so I rejoice with you in your decision to follow Christ, and we want to help you know Jesus. This is the greatest decision you ever made. God bless you.